You're tuned into Holy Smokes, Cigars, Catholicism, and Conversation. <laughs> Let my prayer arise and thy sight as incense. I'm your host, Dustin Quick, and this is episode 72, From Her Majesty to the Magisterium with Gavin Ashenden. Um, before we get into today's episode, just a word about my sponsor, Havana Palace on Huron Church Road in Windsor, Ontario, Canada. For the best service and finest cigars, go see Caesar and Eli. They treat all their customers like family. So if you would be so kind as to visit their Facebook page at facebook.com slash Havana Palace and give their page a like, I would greatly appreciate it. Now, guys, <clears throat> I do apologize. We had some te te technical difficulties, but by God's grace, we were able to overcome them. So we're, there was a bit of a delay. So my sincere apologies, but we're here now. We're, we're ready to do this, and I'm so excited, I'm so blessed, I'm so honored to have Gavin Ashenden on today, former Anglican bishop and chaplain to Her Majesty the Queen of England, if you can believe that. No, that's not a joke, it's real. Uh, in the flesh, how are you doing this uh, afternoon or morning, depending on where you're at, Gavin? Well, you know that God's at work when all your equipment goes down. Yes. When, I was a, when I was an Anglican parish priest, I had a printer that, and I'm not exaggerating, it behaved very well from Monday to Friday. Saturday evening, when I began to print stuff out, uh, it would just misbehave perpetually. Mm. And that was the first time I began to learn to use prayers of deliverance for computer equipment. But right. I've, I've begun to think that in the same way, because evil mimics good, in the same way that we have our patron saints for various causes, I, I strongly suspect there are particular demonic entities yep. that are designed or responsible for screwing up our uh, electronics when it's offered to Jesus. And so yes. sometimes sometimes it's okay, but there are other times, and this has been one of them, where literally everything went wrong. Uh, iPhone, camera, microphone, earpods, yeah. e electricity, laptop battery, it all, oh, lights, they, they all failed. Everything. So I'm wow. really sorry we're late. Every, literally everything failed. Well, <laughs> everything's been restored and Christ restores all things. So there you go. There's a powerful testimony. Um, yeah, so um, I'm so excited to have you on today. And what I wanted to do um, <clears throat> is just, uh, my viewers might not be familiar with you and your work and your journey. So what I wanted to do is just kind of go over your journey from your, sort of your earliest memories uh, until how did you how did you become an Anglican bishop? How did you become the Queen's chaplain, for goodness sake? That's quite a high post. And how did you ultimately come into full communion with Rome? So these are the issues that we're going to touch on today. And uh, I will interject, um, you know, at various points with maybe some questions or reflections. But I'm going to leave it to you. The floor is yours, my dear brother. So uh, where did you grow up in England? Um, and how was your faith life growing up? What, was your, what were some of your earliest memories and influences? Uh, it is, it, I mean, these testimonies can be, either be such a blessing if the person uh, offering them uh, puts their feet on the right stepping stones, but they can be terribly tedious. If if we don't, so help, God help me find the right stepping stones. Um, my father was an Anglican, faithful Anglican Christian, and he had begun as a Baptist and found his way to being Anglican with atheist parents, uh, all on his own at school. Um, my mother was a non-believer and actually messed around with with mediums. So mm. so insecure was she, and there were sociological reasons for that, but always very profound spiritual consequences. Mm. Um, so my father took me to the local church and I had a great, I, I now realize I had more of a sense of God than I knew. And the reason I know that is because when I was at uh, what we call prep school in England, which is a school for children from six to 12, mm. um, we had assemblies and every assembly was profoundly Christian. They read from the Bible. I remember I first learned the prayer of St. Ignatius of Loyola there. Um, we sung wonderful hymns. But what happened to me was that as they read passages from the Bible, my hair would stand up, up on the back of my neck. And I remember particularly Samuel and Eli uh, and, and Elisha and the axe heads and Elijah uh, and, and the prophets of Baal and, uh, uh, and I only I am left. And uh, there were uh, and a Daniel and there are, I don't know, a dozen, a dozen episodes, mainly from the Old Testament, mm -hmm. uh, that simply... Um, were 
run a short circuit of electricity through me. Now, I thought this happened to everybody. I thought everyone must be having a really numinous experience. And then mm. we, we, had a, a, we had a reunion of boring old farts um, uh, <laughs> about five years ago. And I went around to some of these guys who are quite famous now. They're judges and chairman of the BBC and others. And I said, guys, in assembly, what happened? And they went, oh, those were dreadful. Complete yawn. I said, did the hairs on your neck never stand up? No. What are you talking about? Never. <laughs> so it was only then that I realized that actually God had given me a certain grace as a child. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then um, the next thing that happened, and again, there are always two levels, aren't there? There's this kind of historical, superficial, rational, political narrative, and then there's what the Holy Spirit does. Right. And it often takes us quite a long time to catch up with what the Holy Spirit's been doing. So my father wanted to send me away to a, 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 a posh a private, we call them public schools here. And there are you know, half a dozen very good ones. And he decided he wanted one that, that excelled in rugby and music. So he looked for rugby. Now, now frankly, I know and th that he could have chosen any one of a dozen. Uh, but but he, the one that came to mind was at Canterbury. And so the one at Canterbury was built around Canterbury Cathedral. So from the age of 12, I was sent to live in the precincts of Canterbury Cathedral because that's where this school happened to be. And if you want to be pretentious, and sometimes they do, the school actually goes back to 597. It goes back to when Augustine came to Canterbury mm. with a group of monks and they started they started a, a school to educate the local children and to bring up monks and priests and it, and, and it has gone on continuously without a break, we're told. I, and there's no reason not to believe it. The records right. that and, until today. So it's the oldest school in England. And But uh, so for, for, for some people, it was pretentious because it was built around Canterbury Cathedral. But for me, oh, there goes one of my lights. There goes the other light. <laughs> See? See, there you go. <laughs> of course it does. We, we can't get a break, can we? <laughs> wait, wait one second. Well, I, it should take me just a moment to fix it. I'm, but I, I saw that coming. Um, so, uh, the lights, of course, also the light, the lights, the batteries were lost. But now, oh, gee. When the other batteries are found, and but these are very, very primitive lights. And they, so, there we go. Hooray. Oh, okay. all right. Back in business. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> oh, but we're so up for, for what's going to happen. Um, so, but, but in the Holy Spirit, I now see. That the Lord, in His great mercy, sent me to uh, to, to live uh, and sleep and eat and drink where St. Augustine had planted the Catholic Church. Now, there's a notion amongst Anglicans that they're the Catholic Church, and it's 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 complete self-delusion. It's a delusion that grabbed me for most of my life, but I'm free of it now. It's utterly historically and spiritually um, nonsense, but we'll explain why, perhaps. Yes. However, uh, however, there I was in Canterbury for five years. And I would, I was just entranced by the cathedral. I would, I would walk through it to get to classes rather than around it. I would sit where Thomas Becket was murdered and talk to him, um, and be astonished at his confrontation with authority for Jesus, as, and also his change of character, his change of allegiance. Uh, I would, uh, I, I was, uh, there were moments of utter, utter beauty uh, mm. when we when we walked in candlelight singing Palestrina and the Advent responses and. And I knew this exquisite, passionate beauty was was Jesus. Well, I didn't know it was Jesus. I knew it was I knew it was God. For some strange reason, I had to make a convoluted journey to Jesus. But I had five years of, of sharpening my appetite for the numinous. Uh, and again, I think the Holy Spirit. We know He works in the depths without our being consciously aware of it, you know. Yes. Unconscious we are. And and I took my confirmation seriously. I was and. Um, but I had, I had this. Um, again, I, I, I rather think people who listen to me often will will know this. I rather think we all suffer from multiple personality disorder. It's just that some of us are stitched back, stitched together a little more securely than others. But it's all, it's always a bit flaky. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, I decided that that not only that I would be a Christian one year and an, an atheist the next year to try them out. I and see. all that, all that really meant in practice, I wasn't particularly intelligent or philosophically astute but it really well on the other hand i wasn't wrong either 
it, it always comes down to ethics. It's much more about ethics than it is about, about intellectual allegiance. Because as an atheist, I didn't have to share the things I really rather liked, like my bootleg alcohol and my, my, my pipe tobacco, speaking of which. Um, but, as a, but, but as a Christian, uh, I, I knew that I did. And it was, I realized it was harder being a Christian and easier being an atheist. And I was glad, therefore, when the years came and I could, I could be an atheist. So when I left school, however, uh, it was the atheist year. And I thought, this is good because I have no experience of sex or drugs. And I would like some of both. Right, 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 right. <laughs> and so I went out to North America and, uh, and, and, and wondered. This was the, the uh, early 70s. And I thought, well, perhaps, perhaps I'll come my way. And they didn't come my way at all. <laughs> Thanks be to God. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. I would, you'd have found me being a bit grumbly at the time. But instead, um, I taught, I ended up, I did a number of jobs. I, 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 I acted as a waiter. I played unaccompanied Bach on Young Street uh, to, to busk and get money to eat. I, uh, but I had, at the end of it all, uh, an experience that, that was the breaking down of all things. It, was, it, it ended up by being an out-of-the-body experience. Uh, our boss mm. had been not paying us, and I, my musical colleagues had said, Gavin, would you go and persuade him? You are, you're, you're more, more Neanderthal than the rest of us. <laughs> and, <laughs> well, they actually said you're training to be a lawyer, so maybe you can persuade him. And yeah, yeah, makes half, sense. Yeah. Halfway through, I, I discovered my powers of persuasion were limited, and I began to pick him up by the lapels and 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 bang him against the wall, which I which which I was so upset about. I didn't want to do this, and it had a terrible effect on me. Anyway, it had a good effect on him. He agreed to pay us, <laughs> <laughs> but I but I went away, and I, there was an end of kind of camp party and I'd brought a, a liter of vodka to, to, to share around and I, I went and slumped miserably in a corner feeling very disturbed by this violence and I drank a liter of vodka um, hmm. and uh, I know I, I, I buried enough students as university chaplain to know the dreadful harm that alcohol as a poison can do on your respiratory system and you don't your respiratory system really doesn't keep going with a whole liter of neat spirits in it and and I left my body and went to judgment uh, and so, um, uh, and I have a number of th reasons for thinking this really happened, as opposed to thinking it's a, some kind of construct of my unconscious or my or my reading. And mm -hmm. so, so first of all, drinking a liter of alcohol of, of spirits, uh, and I knew nothing about near death experiences at uh, this age. Uh, but I, I saw myself leave my body. I, I went to the light, and it was not the light. It was every, I, I, I could tell. There was a distinction between the light and this. This is this is what light, all light emanated into. It was it was the source of light rather than light. Mm -hmm. I was judged. I had a picture of myself as a uh, an old fashioned Hollywood telephone switchboard with all the cables in the wrong sockets and knotted up. And and one of the things was good. You know, it all had to be untangled. And then I was judged, and the court went away, and I heard. I heard something from, I think, from Revelation chapter 8, although I didn't know that at the time. Uh, there was silence in heaven for half an hour. Now now I know this is this presages the fight between St. Michael uh, and and the, the, the deviant angels. But, but that verse came into whatever, my soul or my mind. And then the court came back and I was pronounced forgiven. And mm. I could start again. And I, the next thing that happened was, oh, and the, the, the light was both single and plural, singular and single and plural um, that was the other strange sensation um, uh, which when I began to understand to study Trinitarian theology later on uh, I thought well that's interesting these things over yeah around. singular and plural yeah <laughs> yes and so you know there, there's no way an, an 18 year old uh, would be atheist uh, however many times he wandered in and out of Canterbury Cathedral could I think have constructed these images. The unconscious is an extraordinary and always to be wondered at phenomenon, but it has its limits. Uh, but but the thing that makes me think it really, really happened is that I have a very bad constitution for alcohol. I I, mm. I can take a couple of pints and then, you know, I'm, I, if I drink much more than that, I have to stay close to lavatories, washrooms for the next couple of days. I just, my body just doesn't like it. Yeah. Uh, and I came to, so this would be a, what, five hours after drinking this vodka, uh, feeling physically and spiritually almost better than I have in my life. And I had a profound sense I'd been forgiven. So strong was this sense I'd been forgiven 
that I knew I, I prayed. And I said, well, how do I keep this? And the answer was, well, you, you pass it on. So as soon as breakfast came, I went looking for the man I'd beaten up the night before in order to forgive him. And he came out of uh, one of the camping huts and uh, he saw me coming. So he turned the other way and I, his name was Ricardo. I said, Ricardo, please come here. And then I walked after him. He walked faster. I walked faster. He ran. I ran. It became, it was like, it was like a black and white movie. It was ludicrous. Oh, my I, goodness. I caught him. I turned him around. I picked him up by the lapels. And he thought, oh, God, not again. Here, here we go again. Yeah. I said, I'm here to forgive you. <laughs> and you've got to forgive me. I said, shaking him. It was ludicrous. He, we, uh, I don't think he understood. I, I, who knows what he thought. However, um, this was a, a very profound experience. And what surprises me is I took it in my stride and just went on living without, it didn't send me to church. It didn't put me on my knees every night as it should have done. I think because I'd, I'd strongly suspected God from, from my, you know, youngest years. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, it's just, of course it's God. What else would it be? But I didn't have any sense that he, that he had a claim on me. I had a claim on him for forgiveness. Oh, anyway, the, be that whatever the reasons for my incompetence were, um, put it just put it down to spiritual incompetence or, 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 um, or stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mustn't laugh at the whole thing. Shakes. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I, I, um, I, I went. I went to law school, and uh, halfway through law school, about a year and a half later, I had a really serious crisis, which I couldn't resolve, uh, and it was a life or death crisis. And I thought, what on earth happened? the last time i was already thinking in terms of precedent even if only existentially what happened the last time oh yes god i better go and find him so i went to find god and there was an anglican parish church at the end of the road um and uh as things happen in the in the kingdom uh, somebody had planned a university mission for about seven days later um i was very rude to the vicar i i went in mm -hmm after not finding, it was morning morning prayer, prayer book. And of course, one of the things that I, I didn't understand at the time, and so many people don't, is that although I thought there was something wrong with the church and I couldn't see the presence of God, it didn't occur to me that the fault lay in me, that it was unconfessed sin or my or poor radar. So I went up as I left, I said to the view, he said, nice to see you. And I said, thank you very much. Thank you for the service. Uh, I said the peace was very good. That was after the peace. I found my attempts to pray improved. Keep that up. Uh, and he said, "Will you see? You, will we see you again?" No, I said, "I'm not coming again." God wasn't here. This, you know, sorry. just like that, just like yeah, that. I'm sorry. So I'm looking. I'm looking for God, and He wasn't here. But you know, if this is what you want to do, I was so pretentious. I mean, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm so sorry. He became a friend of mine, and I apologize. Well, for that's him. good. Yeah. Okay. So he said, well, there's a there's a, a mission, if you're really serious, go and listen. And, and the mission was led by a man called David Watson, who was a very famous evangelist and also one of the pioneers of the charismatic movement. And uh, I experienced a provisional conversion to Christ. So it was provisional because I said, Lord, th this sounds like you. You, G you, Jesus, sound like this encounter with forgiveness and light and judgment and mercy and, and new birth. So, but I said, these Americans, you know, American evangelicals are very tricky people, and they're, they're Amer I was quite sure that uh, knowing nothing about nothing, nothing significant about Wesley, that you know, evangelicalism was a fault of the Americans. So I thought, God save me from being trapped by an American cult. Uh, and if it's <laughs> if it's not you, I'm off. So I will give myself to you for forty eight hours at a time. I will say my prayers. Uh, I, I will stop glancing at women surreptitiously in the street, and I will. <laughs> And I'll go to church. It's a bit like the early first council at Jerusalem. You know, don't don't murder, or refrain from blood and meat. Yeah, and very it's, basic stuff. Yeah, very, very <laughs> basic stuff. And then um, the two things happened. I began to get attacked by the devil, and I I, I started going to church and getting closer to Jesus. And uh, then about a year and a half later, I graduated. Was wanted to be a Christian lawyer very badly, uh, and then I, I was just blown away by by a vocation to the priesthood that I didn't feel. Other, other people felt it. I mean, literally to the point of people coming up about every 48 hours. I took a year off to, uh, to, to have a last, a last 12 months of being a freelance musician before I entered the real grown-up world. And I thought, well, I'll pray about going to, to qualify professionally or, 
or becoming a priest. But I wasn't very impressed by the Angli I'm sorry to say, but the Anglican clergy I, I had met were not very masculine people. They were not. They did. They they, they, they under. I was left underwhelmed. God forgive. God have mercy on me, an underwhelming sinner. But nonetheless, <laughs> um, uh, but but it but it came thick and fast. And the, because I'd become a charismatic, I was in the habit of hearing from God in one way or another. And I think quite genuinely, I think the charismatic movement was a wonderful form of, of neo-mysticism, which hmm. uh, is designed, intended, to, to, intended to, to draw us into the mystical theology of the church uh, as, a, as, an, as a means to that end. But it became, of course, like so many things, it became an end in itself. Right. Um, and uh, however, I, I was very open to the Holy Spirit telling me things and very, very open, you know, very, Aware the devil attacked me at critical moments in profound and most terrible ways, um, but the Lord wouldn't speak to me. However, He sent other people, and every forty-eight hours, someone came up to me and would say, "Are you becoming a priest? Are you going to be a vicar? Are you going to? Are you going to?" Mm -hmm. I'm saying, "Who have you been talking to? Go away! Get off!" <laughs> uh, and after about nine months, I thought, "Well, this this is not a conspiracy amongst friends and associates. This is the Holy Spirit." So I yeah. became. Uh, and I thought, well, if the worst comes to the worst, uh, a law degree is a really quite, it's a fairly tough uh, series of hurdles. And and during it, there were all kinds of philosophical questions that I wanted to answer. I had a marvelous criminal law tutor who used to invite us to, to, to drinking whiskey and philosophy late at night. And in fact, when I became a, a member of faculty at the university for 25 years, I, I started a group called Skeptics Anonymous, modeled on his approach, mm -hmm. so people could come and talk about their longing for God, their, mm. their philosophical and intellectual questions. But, um, but I said, well, at least I get to do a theology degree, and that, that you know what, that will be a huge joy. Mm. And to my surprise, I found I was called to be a priest, and I then became an Anglican priest. And uh, in fact, uh, two days ago was the forty-second anniversary of my my ordination. Although, of course, I have. I have questions about what I was ordained to now. Yes, 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 <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Uh, So then I then I set up. Then I mean to put it very simply, I I spent ten years working in uh, parishes. Then I got a few more degrees, including a PhD, and I went to teach at a university where I was a became a senior lecturer in psychology and uh, ran an interfaith chaplaincy team of about twelve or thirteen people. Uh, I um, I became a chaplain to the Queen because. Um, as I went round, I, I would I would do some evangelism and some theological schools in Lent, and people quite liked me. And the way in which Anglicanism works is that uh, the lay the laity get to put forward names about people they want to be their bishops, just like uh, in the early church. Yes, quite well. Yes, except that except that the <laughs> establishment pays pays no attention. So it's all like so many things in Anglicanism. I'm really sorry about this. It's all cosmetic. It it looks good. It sounds good, but it doesn't deliver. So of course, you know the poor the poor laity think they're contributing, but actually it's all run by smoke filled committees, and and people who belong to certain tribes, cabals, interest groups, uh, and um, uh, and, and you'll, you'll pardon my sounding pompous. So my, my name was put on the table, and and then it, it gets it got swept off regularly. And poor Rowan Williams. Uh, we got so fed up with my name being swept off for reasons he he couldn't quite understand that he literally phoned the palace and said to Her Majesty, could you please give Gavin something? Oh, <laughs> wow. So, Rowan Williams. Uh, yes. Well, so his, his, his secretary, he told me, his, his secretary uh, one morning phoned me up and said, have you had a letter from the palace appointing you as chaplain of the Queen? I said, yes, I have, but but I have no idea why. And he said, well, I've just come from, from a Eucharist in Lambeth Palace where, where the Archbishop has offered the Eucharist in Thanksgiving for your appointment when it came because he phoned the palace. So, I mean, you know, it, it's very sweet and very kind. Um, uh, but but the downside of this <laughs> is that it's all smoke and mirrors. The Queen has 36 chaplains, and none of them do anything worthwhile unless mm -hmm. they preach at St. James's Palace, they wear, they wear frocks that cast cassocks to make them look like cardinals, they get invited to receptions, but it's all superficial. Now, now it just so happens that... Um, if ambassadors who go to the court of St. James where you preach or ladies-in-waiting or members of the royal household like you and they say to themselves, this is somebody I can talk to, then you develop a pastoral ministry. But it's behind the scenes and it, it, it comes 
again by the Holy Spirit and usually through someone's breakdown or misery. Uh, I once, the, the point at which I almost got most involved was when there was some very serious bullying. And I, I remember conspiring with uh, a member of the Royal Household. How do we get a, how do we get a letter about this into the Queen's handbag? Because <laughs> if they went through the normal channels, the normal channels, channels are the ones doing the bullying. And so mm. we, uh, anyway, I only offer that as an example of, uh, uh, of how, of uh, almost the unreality of it. But, um, but nonetheless, you got to preach the gospel at the center of the establishment and God did things and people became friends. And, you know, I, I can't, I, I obviously can't say, um, I can't go into detail at all because that would be wholly and completely improper. But, mm. but so I just want to say that as a system, it's completely cosmetic and ridiculous. But actually, God, God can use even the cosmetic and the ridiculous to... Oh, of course, of course. You know, I, I've always been curious, Gavin... <clears throat> The, um, the 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 Anglicanism of the official court. Uh, what what stripe would it be? I mean, it's obviously on the a higher ceremonial side, but in terms of like private devotions, would would these people feel comfortable with things like uh, asking saints for intercession or the rosary? Or is that is is this more of a via media that we're talking about here? It doesn't even get as high as via media. It, it, no, it, it's okay. via is via profundo. <laughs> so the queen, the queen is essentially a low church Anglican. She likes matins, and uh, and the royal family like matins. And we were told that when we ordered our our, our cassocks, that if we met Prince Philip and we were wearing uh, um, thirty nine buttons, in other words, we wore a Catholic style cassock dress up the front, the, the prince wouldn't want to speak to us, and uh, oh. it, it, it had to be low church, double breasted, or else, or else, or else. <laughs> oh, so it was, it's low church then. Okay. Yeah. Essentially. So having said that, um, the senior chaplain who was based in the palace uh, at that time was a most lovely Anglo-Catholic priest. So an Anglo-Catholic got appointed as a senior chaplain and he heard confessions. And, and so he brought a bit of a, a, a bit of Catholicism or Anglo-Catholic culture into the heart of it. But essentially, it's uh, uh, it's unfussy and uncatholic and Hmm. And what what I what, I, what the Anglo Catholic well I, let me not be rude at this point but anyway so that that's how it was um, so no very 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 much not the intercession of saints not Our Lady not the Rosary hmm. and not the sacrifice of the Mass. Okay, thank you for clearing that up because it's something I've always wondered about. So, so how long how long did you how long <clears throat> how long did you actually hold that post for? Well, I was appointed quite early <laughs> because and again there was a sort of. I'm so sorry. I'm being lured into sounding pompous and self-important, but there was a kind of rule of thumb that if you were, if you were appointed early, then you would you would eventually be appointed something more senior. And if you're appointed late, then it was a kind of pat on the head. You know, good luck. You nearly got there, but this is a condolence prize. Okay. So being appointed quite young, I thought, well, perhaps I can become the longest-serving chaplain. Um, but but what happened was during this period of time, I had become a progressive. Uh, well, I was I was theologically orthodox, but ethically progressive, right. uh, and the reason for that was the university that I would I, I worked at for 20, nearly twenty five years was uh, was was the most pretty well, the most radical university in our country, and it was also one of the centres of, of 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 gaiety, and so I had a lot of gay students and gay colleagues. Um, and I, I, I'm very fond of eccentric, vulnerable people. And as it so happens, that gay people are often quite eccentric and quite vulnerable. So, uh, and I wanted to, to to bring the love of Christ. And so, the the, the developed a narrative, a Christian narrative in the 18, 1980s particularly, about why it was that that the New Testament was mistaken in its criticism of homosexual behavior and actually meant something else altogether. Mm -hmm. And uh, that anyone with any spiritual empathy would realize that all that mattered was that people loved each other in an ongoing way and didn't gay people love each other in an ongoing way and therefore make the world a nicer place. Do you remember that? It was a kind of jingle in the 1980s. I want to teach the world to sing. It became a Coca-Cola advert. Mm. This is a theological equivalent of the Coca-Cola advert. <laughs> you know, daisies and 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 uh, and, uh, uh, and prettiness everywhere. But of course, it's it's actually spiritually uh, utterly uh, wrong. 
but it look but, but if you're at all attracted to the gospel of nice and so many christians are uh, or so many people are we're back to morally thera morally therapeutic deism uh -huh. then it's very powerful indeed because you appear to be compassionate kind inclusive welcoming to the outcasts you know all 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 the kind of superficial marks that 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 go into covenanted christianity but without any of the spiritual discernment so i had so i i i lived this for about 15 years and then a number of a couple of events which i won't go into now though i have spoken about them elsewhere made me entirely rethink uh and, and what made me rethink was that the the shop window of homosexual lifestyle and the reality of what actually happened were so very far apart from each other that this produced it this produced a sort of level of, of, of dissonance for me as i i found that um the mess in people's lives that i was dealing with as a priest and a pastor uh was so far away from uh eccentric people with exotic sexual appetites loving each other that that uh, that i realized the narrative wasn't true and then I, I went to a friend of mine who was a catholic diocesan exorcist that i worked with from time to time who was a wonderful man called father john abberton and uh uh and then John had, John had been telling me for a while that I was completely wrong. And I, I remember we were standing, we were late for a meeting. And I said, John, remind remind me of the Catholic Orthodox teaching of sexuality. I mean, this might sound a very silly thing to say, but, you know, we had half an hour to kill. And I was having to re... I, what I wanted to do was to reconfigure my theological presuppositions of pastoral practice. Right. And I had, I'd so got used to this, you know quasi fruit of the spirit approach well if they, if there's a bit of love and joy and peace and kindness and patience if these people are nice to each other and they stroke each other and they stay together who are you to say this is not love and does you know those who live in love live in god st john says well, no, this these terrible non sequiturs mm. <laughs> that everyone including me fell through so john john father john said gave me the you know a, a brief synopsis and so i just i decided for the next 12 months as i encountered pastorally students with difficult and staff with difficulties that i would run both narratives in my head I, i'd run i'd run the nice one and mm -hmm. i'd run the orthodox one and really i was only a few weeks into this and it became perfectly clear that the orthodox christian narrative told the truth about the encounters that i was dealing with and the nice one didn't and i went oh my goodness i i, I have to repent i remember going to the uh the, the there's a very um well-known gay activist in the church of england who i'm very very fond of and I saw him at General Synod, went up to see him and said, I said, he said, Gav, nice to see you. Give me a kiss. How are you? We had a big, you know, kiss and hug. And I, I put my hands on him. And I said, his name was Colin, Colin Coward. I said, Colin, my dear friend, I said, I've got something very serious to tell you. But look, I said, before I tell you, you know, I love you. Yes, he said, I know you love me. You know, I love all of you. There were some lesbians putting up publicity in the corner. Yes, Gav, you know, you're one of our great allies. We, of course, you love her. We're sorry you're straight, but we know you love us. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I, said, well, I said, Colin, we're wrong. We've got to repent. I'm really sorry. This is all, this is all sin. Right. And he, looked, he looked at me and he called the lesbians over and he said, Gav's having a nervous breakdown. And I said, no, Colin, mm. really, I'm not. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm having a theological breakdown. Uh, and, and as always... Uh, in breakdowns, God does a breakthrough. And I said, look, my dear man, it's sin. We can't go this, you know. And, and look, I want you to know, I, I'm now going to say this in public, but I want you to know every time you hear me say this, please know it's not homophobia. You know I love you. Right, right. <laughs> but we're in the wrong. <laughs> we have to change. It's We have to repent. Anyway, he, um, he did know I loved him. Uh, and I think he found this quite difficult to begin with. Although, you know, uh, shortly afterwards, uh one becomes uh one becomes unwelcome <laughs> um yeah. but then my difficulty was that i was now in a i was in a university things were becoming increasingly progressive and one of the things i had seen was that the trajectory we're about 2011 now the trajectory of woke culture was that it was going to end up with the sexualization of children yeah. and the absence of free speech and so yeah. I, and and i thought and, and you're sacking <laughs> um, because the moment right. you, the moment you come out, I mean, the hysterical thing is there's, there's a there's a marvelous woman uh, called um, a philosopher uh, called um, uh, Catherine Stock, uh, yes. and uh, so Catherine was a colleague of mine, and she was probably one of my my serious political enemies in the sense that 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 she was a leading feminist lesbian philosopher and 
uh, and I was a I was a white male heterosexual uh, priest suspected of orthodox leanings. <laughs> so, oh boy! And, and you know, I mean, I had and I had trouble in faculty meetings because I wanted I was teaching courses on the Inklings, on Lewis and Tolkien and Charles Williams, and and my English faculty colleagues were furious with me because they said, you know, these these are straight white Christian males. We yeah. you know we don't want any of this stuff here. And, we used to have huge fights, and so people like Kathleen Stock looked at me with deep suspicion. Now, if you now if you had told me that ten years later, I would I I by resigning would have escaped being sacked, but the Kathleen, the poster girl for lesbian radical intellectual culture, would be sat would be sacked would would would, mm. would be thrown out of the university as she has been for failing to to tick the right boxes in trans culture. I would have been. I wouldn't have believed it. But that's what's happened. Kathleen's had to leave. She's been driven out by the students because she's a turf and uh, oh. and and failing and not progressive enough. However, um, God bless her. We're, we're now allies <laughs> against the against the trans deception. Um, uh, but uh, what happened? So I, I realized I had to resign. Uh, that that I you know I I kept on being asked to do gay blessings. And I would make excuses. I, I'm 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 going to a conference. I'm I'm teaching. I'm unwell. I'm away. You know. But but they you know after a while they catch you. <laughs> they catch on. Yeah. Yeah. So I resigned and uh, and went to spend five years as a parish priest on the island of Jersey, working. I I I I didn't take a salary because I I had a small university pension and they 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 give you a roof and I thought well with my with my half pension and a roof I I can. Be, I can give myself for free to the church, um, and uh, so that's what I did. But I, I had become what I'm leaving out of this is that during this period of time, I found myself uh, having diabolic attacks. Uh, the, the devil had died down for a while, um, but I was very badly attacked. It was quite extraordinary and, and, and absolutely terrifying. And so I went to my dear father John. Uh, and I said, John, I've I've just I've been kept awake by hell all night, and I think I'm I'm either, I'm either having a nervous breakdown or else, or else um, the gap between me and hell has become over thin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we talked about it, and he said, No, no, you're 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 suffering a very serious attack. Um, mm. You have to pray the rosary. And I said, Well, I don't really believe in Our Lady like that. John was a wonderful Northern blunt northern yorkshire and and he said well well my boy he said you've got to choose between our lady and hell it's up to you i wouldn't rate your chances very highly <laughs> <laughs> so I, I chose our lady uh, and the, the attacks went on for three nights and at the end of it all the room was filled with the scent of roses and the devil left uh and i think probably that was the moment that i was obviously bound to be a catholic because uh, I wanted to get as close to Our Lady as possible, so I, I read a great deal. I I, uh, I was fairly well read in the in the Catholic mystics of the 14th and 15th centuries and 16th centuries. Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, Teresa and Bridget of Sweden and Catherine of Siena and Julian of Norwich, obviously, and Marjorie Kemp uh, uh, and um, uh, uh, and earlier Hildegard of Bingen, but but but. Um, but like like so many Anglicans, I wanted the benefits of Catholicism without paying the price for it. Uh, and I would have gone on in that luxurious self-indulgence if it hadn't been for the Church of England consecrating women as bishops. I already believed and, and, and had a fairly clear theological understanding of why it was wrong to consecrate women in persona Christi at the altar. Um, but 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 I was persuaded that that this was an experiment in discernment, uh, and that therefore it could be withdrawn from. But once you consecrate bishops, it's an entirely different matter. And so, the first woman bishop was consecrated, and I went into my church to say the office in the morning, and I, I just knelt down and said, and said, Lord, I, 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 I can't take a step further. I have to resign my orders. The, my orders are no longer, if they were, if they ever were valid, which I had begun to doubt. They're not valid from today onwards because I'm, you know, my vows of obedience are to people who are destroying your church, and I'm not willing to make them or keep them. So I have to, and you know, and, and all priests are there uh, on behalf of their bishops. None of us, none of us were there. Right, you know, right. Our priesthood is not our gift or our profession. It's we are we are standing in vicariously uh, for the bishop who stands in for the apostles who stands in for Jesus, and uh, it, it was broken. So I resigned. 
And it, but but some Anglican continuing uh, Anglicans had come to me and said, "We have a plan for the re-evangelization of England, and we need some Orthodox bishops." With, and, and our bishops have Catholic orders because a bishop of Brazil called uh, Duarte Costa in 1946 fell out with the Vatican over Nazis, and it's it's a separate story. Um, his secretary smuggled his resignation papers into his morning correspondence, and and by half past eleven, uh, at the Vatican's behest, he found he'd resigned his see mm. <laughs> by the papers without looking at them. Uh, and he then started the Independent Catholic Church of Brazil and consecrated a few of his Capellians, and they consecrated me. So the orders were were valid, and I thought, well, this is wonderful. Now I now I know that my masses are my masses are real. Um, and then I began five years or so of trying to gather together. Uh, uh, there are four or five Anglican independent Orthodox groupings. Uh, and the idea was that as the Church of England died, the Orthodox might be brought together. Uh, and I very quickly discovered that with egos and the spectrums of theology and politics, without a magisterium, the whole thing was impossible. And once again, it was another example of Excuse me. Anglicans playing at being Catholics uh, and using, if you like, the... Um, the structures, the dress, and, and the customs, but without the substance. And you know, the, the substance here is the magisterium. And if you don't have the magisterium, you you can't do it. Um, and uh, at this point, the local Catholic bishop, in God's timing, asked to see me and said, uh, "You're a Catholic, and I'd quite like your help in my diocese." Uh, would you resign your orders and become a Catholic? And so I prayed. I said, well, Lord, this is this. Uh, well, he first of all said, when are you going to convert? And I said, well, a bit like Constantine, probably near the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and he said, well, please convert now. And I said, well, what do you mean? Well, all right. I said, I, I could convert quite soon. I want to write a book and explain to people why. And so he said, well, how long would that take? And I said, well, a year or two. And he said, would, would you consider converting in a week or two? So I prayed. And, you know, sometimes the Lord is clear. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord said, do it now. So I said, yes, okay. And I was received two weeks later. Wow. So what do you think the, uh, so these can, I think it's the the continuing Church of England, like these independent sort of. There are several of them. We the, we, we need to, we need, in order to, to speak accurately and not defame them, we need to, to talk about each one separately if we were going to do that. Uh, but so there are three or four groups, three or four ecclesial bodies. Okay. A, a, a very different theological and ecclesial preferences. So what do you think, so their kind of ethos is to stay in the Church of England, restore Catholicity, and fight the good fight, and not... Oh, no, no we're, no, we're, no, we're beyond that. No, they, they've all left. I mean, God bless them. Mm. They, they've they all showed some courage and, and some sacrifice. They've all left, or, or, or they've joined bodies that had, had left. So there's something called the Free Church of England, full of some very lovely people and very good friends of mine. But it's a very, it's an ultra Protestant uh, reaction to the Oxford movement that was formed in the 1860s. Right. Uh, right. And there's the Anglican Catholic Church in England, which is an American plant over here. There's the there's, there's another one called the Catholic Anglican Church in England. Uh, there was my group, a wonderful group of people called the Christian Episcopal Church. Uh, there's a very low church evangelical one, very Protestant indeed, Calvinistic, called the Anglican Mission to England. Uh, there's about four of them. How many? There's probably, probably a couple more. I've forgotten. So many all, options. Well, it's all so. So one, the first thing you have to do is to bring them all together in a single ecclesial body, or or else what do you think you're doing? You know, is these we're not building religious clubs for our own theological preferences. If we were really going to try, if convinced that the Anglican Church was apostate, we were going to say, well. Uh, Anglicanism can, is an authentic ecclesial option. Uh, let us bring it to you. You can't then turn up with five different warring versions of it and be expected to be taken seriously. Mm. So, so one of the things I said was, look, well, we know what's happened in America. They tried this in America. There's 55 options in the continuing church. And they, you know, half of them will speak to each other. The other half of them won't speak to each other. So I said, we know what not to do. So, yeah. you know, but, but it, it turned out that uh, human nature being what it is, it doesn't matter whether you know what to do or not. You, you, you know, it's important. It's Romans seven. When, when I want to be full of Christian unity, uh, behold, <laughs> disunity is at hand. Lord have mercy upon me. You know, uh, Gavin, it's funny. We were talking earlier about the enemy attacking the equipment. Um, Hallie in the chat has said, "I've arrived," meaning I've reached some sort of point on youtube because the spam bots are attacking me i didn't say anything but i had some crude 
comments about uh, sex sex bots and, and this kind of thing in the live chat. So I clandestinely just blocked the user, and I haven't gotten any more message. But uh, uh, it's just it, it's just crazy. The enemy is just on overdrive today, trying to wow. trying to thwart us. Um, especially given that we were talking about you know the Orthodox Catholic position on sexuality. Right when we were talking about that, that's when those messages started to come in. How interesting. So somebody's definitely listening. Um, so would you say um, those those Anglican groups that are very close to Catholicism, High Church, Anglican Catholic, Pray the Rosary, um, believe in relics and sacramentals and all that, do you think their eventual goal is to come into to union with Rome? Is that what they desire, or, or what's the what's their trajectory? Well, in my opinion, which which you know may not be particularly accurate i think we have to go back to newman and pusey uh and so i mean what I, and almost wesley i mean wesley was a sacramentalist uh and there was a very profound holiness movement that was sacramentally alert in in methodism well in wesley rather but when it came to the to the renewal of the sacramental life and the recovery of the lost memory of the catholic church which is i think is what newman was essentially trying to do and then and then given that we given as we read the fathers that we know what what patristic Christianity was like. Uh, and all we have to do is get over the 39 articles, which are uh, aggressively anti-papal and anti-Rome, anti-purgatory. <laughs> yes. And I mean, they really are, they really are quite rude documents. Uh, you know, there was one of them, one of them says, uh, well, we, of course, we accept the authority of the ecumenical councils, except where we don't. Well, I mean, just, <laughs> that's just, you know, that that's ludicrous. Um, so, um, Newman wanted to see whether or not the recovered... Th there has been an Anglican myth which has been that Anglicanism is the continuing church from Augustine. So through mm -hmm. through um, uh, through Henry, the, Henry VIII and Edward VI uh, and Mary and Elizabeth, you, you have a kind of synthesis uh, of, of, of different traditions, but Anglicanism is a, is a, continuity, a continuing synthesis. Right. Now, I think that's a form of self-delusion, as you, I mean, it's a, self, it's a form of self-delusion I indulged in because I wanted to believe it. I, I needed to believe it. But one of the reasons I became a Catholic was I really knew it wasn't entirely true. Uh, and so, um, and so I think if we, Newman realized, Newman became a Catholic because he didn't believe Anglicanism was capable of being renewed in the Catholic faith. Pusey stayed in Anglican because he thought it was. So let's. So a hundred years later, let's ask ourselves a question: Has it been renewed in the Catholic faith? And then I think one has to distinguish between between the ephemerals and and the substance. So the ephemerals are our liturgy and what you wear, uh, and to some extent spirituality. Um, uh, but but you can't have pictures of the Pope in your vestry. But nonetheless, say I repudiate his authority or the authority of his apostolic successors. Mm. I mean, you you can't be an independent Catholic. That's just, you know, it's a contradiction in terms. And so, I'm I'm afraid I think that uh, Ang Anglo Catholicism was an attempt to recover the memory of patristic Christianity and and um, what do you do with what do you do with with uh, with plants? Um, you you bind them on as a sort of graft and to graft it back on. Uh, hoping that, that perhaps it could be grafted on in the 19th century. But the graft failed. And so in the end, uh, Anglo-Catholicism is, is an Im it's a, it's an imitative and insubstantial expression of, 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 of Anglicanism and Catholicism. It doesn't, it doesn't work. And the people who were serious became Catholics when the Ordinariate opened up. I mean, that's yeah. how you test them. That, you know, the, so those who were serious in their Catholicism became Catholics. Those who were never serious in Catholicism have not become Catholics. So I've heard, as a criticism of the ordinariate, they, they say, well, it's it's not authentically English. It's not the English faith. It's, it's Romanisms kind of slapped over or glossed over with some English tradition. It's sort of a Frankenstein. It's not authentically the English faith. But... Uh, as we were discussing before we went live, I found something interesting. So the ordinariate is accused by some of Latinization and it's evil. But I looked at several 
Anglo-Catholic churches online in England. And all of them that I saw, and there were copious amounts because friends gave me suggestions to look at, they're all using the, the Roman Missal. Of course they are. They're yes. not using the BCP. No. Um, they, their dress is Roman. They're having Corpus Christi processions. Um, and what really struck me was I watched a mass from the Anglican shrine. And it was a Novus Ordo. It was the OF, first yeah. of all. Second of all, they commemorated the Pope, your servant Francis. I, I was blown away. So I'm like, I, I'm thinking to myself, you're accusing the ordinariate of being artificial and imposing Latinizations, but the high churches in England are willingly taking on Latinizations. So it's kind of, there's some dissonance there, and it really threw me for a loop. Well, I think what happens is that pe people start with a conclusion, and then they try to justify their conclusion retrospectively. Uh, and so then it's just a matter of choosing your own weapon of choice. So, you know, the weapon of choice is Latinization. But um, if you were to look at, at you know, Anselm or, uh, or Bede, <laughs> I mean, choo choose, choose your English Catholic <clears throat> uh, or John Fisher or mm -hmm. Thomas More. Um, it, it, I would say that, that, that does the does the or is the ordinary at um, uh, Congress with Bede, Anselm, Moore, and Fisher, and the answer is well, of course it is. Um, the, 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 so in, well, they must be talking about culture in terms of Latinization. Mm -hmm. I think the problem is I think there's a great. Yeah, I mean everything has virtue. Everything has a virtue and a vice in it. I mean so and of course the Catholic Church has supreme virtues but it also has some fairly serious vices I mean, if you if you if you do if you study uh, orthodox orthodoxy uh, um one of the great attractions of orthodoxy is that it, it lacks part of the the linear controlling hierarchical not hierarchical bureaucratic uh western mind and the, so the the linear bureaucratic organizational uh, power interested western mind is one of the things that's led to the success of capitalism and 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 technology it's a, and, and science it's a it's a very powerful thing but but in but when it goes off it becomes controlling and superficial and 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 it's the uh, means yeah. rather than the end and so on and orthodoxy often finds its way back to holiness more quickly i think than the west does in, in the, what i mean by that is if you look at the um the way in which the laity and the bureaucracy and orthodoxy work the laity very quickly recognized that uh, Saint, uh, um, uh, the holiness and, and the stadets and, um, and, the, and the bureaucracy are quicker to accept the canonization of holy people in effect than the West is. The West is very cautious and bureaucratic and as a whole system. And, you know, if, if St. Francis gets there, he gets there by the skin of his teeth. And, mm -hmm. uh, it's, you know, it's laborious and technical and bureaucratic and, so you know the downside of that is it's 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 tedious and and, and uh, a bit repressive. But uh, the good side of it is it's thorough, and when it's working well, it gets things right. So it's it's very easy to look at any system and then say, well, I'm going to use these vices and attack it. So there are all yeah. kinds of things we can attack the Roman Catholic and the Western tradition with. But but we should always balance them with the virtues. And I think just to, just to say that the ordinary, for example, contains the vices of Catholicism and none of the virtues, suggests somebody is is prejudiced because that's not a an even-handed analysis. I think the ordinary is, as, as Benedict said, I think it's the most prophetic and wonderful thing. There was there was only one way of doing what Newman and Pusey wanted, uh, and so and, and when when Newman and Pusey were there, it didn't exist, but in our lifetime, it it, it exists. It's the ordinary and it's a it's a free bridge over the Tiber. Come in as you are, bringing bringing your best things. You don't have to. You don't have to leave behind your whole, all the prayers you've been praying for forty years, mm -hmm. um, all all the spirituality, much of which you got from us and have redeveloped in terms of, uh, of of a sort of laicization of the monastic hours. Um, bring it with you, and then you know graft it in to. Uh, to being to, to papal obedience and to uh, belonging to the magisterium and to experiencing the real sacraments and not pretend sacraments, it really is the best of both worlds. Why would you? Why would you not want to celebrate that? It's wonderful. Right, right. There's this, uh, you know, speaking of myths, there's this popular conception that's floating around. Um, good example of it, as we were talking about earlier, was this YouTube video 
by a certain Anglican priest, um, the English church before it was Roman, and it's got about 30,000 views. So the idea is that, you know, before Rome kind of mucked things up in England, there was this independent, autocephalous, Celtic church that knew nothing of papal primacy, that this would have been abhorrent to them. And it was, was, it was only after Rome came in and sort of imposed itself from the top down in the form of St. Gregory the Great and St. Augustine of Canterbury that they knew, or the Synod of Whitby, that they knew anything of Roman primacy. This would have been totally not on their radar and totally foreign. So what about the idea that, you know, from its inception, the English church is independent, free of Roman influence, and this was just a later unfortunate development. Can you speak to that a bit? Yes, let me just look up a date. Um, wait a moment, can we... I should know, but Google is my friend. Um, so, um, okay, the Council of Arles was three, 314. Hmm. Um, and the reason I've gone to that is because uh, we know that when the council was called, there were some English bishops or British bishops. Right. So these, these are the Celtic guys everyone's talking about. So if you have a Western council <laughs> brought together by the Catholic Church and a bunch of Celtic bishops from England turn up at it, in what way are they not Roman? <laughs> right. I mean, in what in what way are they are they self determining uh, Celtic? They they are a, they are making themselves accountable to the church, and and we know that we know that apostolic continuity was an absolutely essential way of dealing with Gnosticism uh, and a plethora of sectarian life. So any any Episcopal Christian who uh, who was invited to councils must have had a sense of apostolic uh, uh, derivation. Hmm. So so uh, if, if you accept the if you say, well, these people went to the Council of Al and there were you know half a dozen of them, then then, then they're within they're within Roman authority. They they're they're part of the Western Church. Now if you then say, well, yeah, but they they weren't Romanized culturally, right. that, that clearly is true. And what we have we, we don't know very much about Celtic Christianity because it's not in the records. But but we know a bit, and we know that they were uh, they were heroic, that they were self denying, they were ascetic. Um, we we know about their monastic practices, and then we know quite a lot from Bede at the Synod of Whitby uh, of how they of how they differed in essentials. And so the Synod of Whitby was an opportunity for uh, for for a moment of convergence where there had been diver some some elements of divergence. Now, if you're a Catholic, then you say um, you have a progressive view of the church. You say, well, here is the Holy Spirit at a moment of crisis. And what does the Holy Spirit do? He, 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 he fulfills Jesus' promise to be with us in all things uh, and to overcome evil and not to break the church and take us to the end. So if you're, if you're a Chalcedonian Christian, you believe that Arianism was a heresy because it lost. You don't say that was an accident of history. You say that's the right. spirit at work. If you if you have to say the same thing of the Synod at Whitby, um, Celtic Christianity gave way to Roman Christianity, and we can we can justify it in some ways and say, well, Roman Christianity was really well organized, and uh, and and it you know the tonsures don't matter that much uh, in terms of the kingdom of heaven and the date of Easter. Uh, you just you just need to agree on it for goodness sake. Um, you can't have two communities to to you know look what that's done between the east and west already. Right. So. so um, I think that those people who want to claim an indigenous, non-papal, non-apostolic English Christianity through the Celtic bishops are fooling themselves. But once again, it's the same principle. You start with the conclusion: I want to get rid of the, the, the of um, the authority and the and accountability to Rome. Right. And, then you, and then you make up your reasons for doing it. And you can make up all kinds of good reasons where there's no documentation because no one can prove you wrong. Can't but prove I, it, yeah. But I but I think it's I think it's a misreading of history. I think it's special pleading, and I think the motivations aren't good. And I don't believe the arguments because they you can't you can't prove them. They're they're overlaid on a historical gap. And in the end, it's a bit like atheists. Why do atheists not want to believe? Because if they had to believe, they would have to offer their minds, their hearts, their sexuality, their their, their pocketbooks, their savings. They'd have to offer all these to God. And the great—it's a bit like my early my early bootleg liquor as a as a an atheist teenager. I get to keep everything if I don't believe in God. The moment you believe in God, 
you have to give it all up. And I think a lot of the furious independence that atheists, the new atheists have showed, is because essentially they are selfish people who want to stay autonomous and to run their own lives. And I suspect that this is the ecclesiastical version of that. Mm. Yeah, so the Synod of Whitby was was uh, the authority of the Pope even front and center on the table for discussion, or was it more a matter of customs and the dating of Easter, like you said? Uh, well, it was both. Um, I, uh, I mean, it was it, it was simply both. But what the Celtic Church, so what all the Christians had to decide was who who had the most authentic expression of faith. Mm -hmm. Um. And it's quite it's quite surprising that the Celtic Church gave way, but I mean it did give way. You know, there wasn't a fight. There wasn't a, you know, there wasn't a rump of Celts who went away saying this is a mistake. We don't recognise the authority of the synod. We are, you know, we're going we're going to. Well, if there was, we don't know about them. <laughs> okay. Right, right. Uh, it, so you know, and that in itself, uh, if if we use the kind of the progressive, how do we how do we decide what the Holy Spirit is about? If we use the, the um, uh, if we use a template that that God in history authenticates his church, then the Synod of Whitby authenticated uh, accountability to Rome. But why wouldn't you want to be accountable to St. Peter? Right, why, right. Why, why, why if, as, you, as you looked at the texts about the, the, the keys given to Peter and, uh, and, the, and Peter's, uh, Peter's prominence in the Council of the Apostles, of course, as so always, Paul is right in some things, but Peter has precedence. I mean, you find, I mean, you interestingly enough, you find as you read St. Paul in Acts, you find him constantly saying, look, um, I, I, I fully recognize these other people have authority, but but I spent 17 years by myself in Saudi in, in Arabia, and, and the Lord spoke to me here, this and the other, and then I went to Rome, and we began to talk, and I promise you I hadn't done any politicking beforehand, and I arrived there, and I, and I submitted myself and made myself accountable. I was That's accountable. Right. They agreed. You know, then Peter fouled up, and I told him. Well, of course, Peter fouls up, and Paul told him. But that doesn't that doesn't change anything about the apostolic nature of the authority that Jesus left. You don't find Paul saying, "You know what? I'm the most important of the apostles. I may have got here last, but I'm the first. He doesn't say that. Mm -hmm. He continue he continues to take the Christian path of humility, but won't deny the charism and the responsibilities he's given. And then he says to the, you know, to the conciliar church, the apostolic conciliar church, look, I think you are misunderstanding the Holy Spirit. And the apostolic conciliar church led by Peter says, oh, oops, <laughs> you're so right. We're sorry. We'll start yeah. again. But, but and this is, this is, this is the, the, if you like, the, the paradigm of, uh, of, of re reform and continuity. So we have to have the apostolic continuity, but the Holy Spirit sends reform and what's important is that we accept the reform without blowing up the system and once again i'm afraid anglicans want to blow up the system and and, and those who are proponents of so-called mysterious celtic christianity want to blow up the system the other words they want reform once again without accountability and the one of the reasons i became a catholic was because i realized that my attempt to to live a reformed a renewed christianity outside the church were doomed to failure and even if i did manage to do that what would then happen uh, you know, they, they would frizzle up, up outside the church, whereas now I'm inside the church with Francis and Augustine and Benedict and Dominic and Bede and, and Fisher and Moore uh, and, 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 and Ignatius of Loyola. I'm inside the church. And that's that's where the renewal has to take place, unless you're a selfish schismatic, in which case you're a selfish schismatic. And, you know, the Orthodox have a similar, uh, a similar narrative about uh, Celtic orthodoxy. You find that in Orthodoxy and in Anglicanism. Um, interestingly on, enough, um, you know now me. at any uh, at any point, Gavin, did you uh, was Orthodoxy on your radar? Did you discern Orthodoxy at all, or was was Catholicism just the logical choice right from the jump? Um, so I spent some time in seminary at an, a Greek Orthodox monastery in Essex called St John's Torshant Knights, okay. and uh, oh. Father Sophroni was the abbot and um, Father Simeon became my 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 older brother in Christ, and took me to Sophroni, who who I, he was about eighty in those days and still painting, 
uh, he's a white Russian uh, Parisian artist. He was still painting on the refectory roof at the age of 80, and I would sit on the scaffolding and 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 talk to him. And at that point, I very badly want, I said to the Lord, Lord, please, can I become Orthodox? I, I love the Jesus prayer. I love the Psalms. I love the liturgy. I love the Eucharist. I love him. This is a much better, this is a much better, stronger, deeper Christianity than Anglicanism. Please, please, may I? And then, uh, you know, again, the thing about being a charismatic is you often, you know, you do, you do get to hear what the Lord says. And he just said, no. Yeah. So every, you know, I then I then joined a, I then joined a, a a group called Keston College, and I ended up smuggling Bibles to the Orthodox in Moscow behind the Iron Curtain, and I met a lot of Orthodox friends, wow. and was was arrested by the KGB and interrogated and threatened with imprisonment, uh, unless I gave the names of the people I was going to see. And then after that, I went and I ran in theological books to the underground Catholic Church in Prague. And met Catholics, friends, and and so I was. I had close links with both Orthodoxy and Catholicism by the Iron Curtain, um, and I said to the Lord, "Any time I can become an Orthodox, I'd like to." And He always said no. So I I would have become an Orthodox for personal preference, but I was also I, mean, I became a Jungian. I lectured in Jung in my progressive period, and and indeed Jung really was the uh, Jung was the uh, how would I? What's the best metaphor? Uh, he, he was he was the uh, the, the railway uh, signals. He, he the, the the points. He was the wrong setting of the points and began to take me mm. into ethical heterodoxy. Um, but um, one of the sensible things Jung said, and as Peterson says, Jung did say some sensible things, even though he was a heretic. Uh, that the, there's a kind of separation of, of the Eastern and Western mind. Uh, and it's not a it's not a very healthy psychic and psychological thing to if you're if you're formed in Western culture to go and live as an east in, in the Eastern mind. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure I couldn't prove that, but I think but I think it's true. And therefore, my, my inheritance is Catholic. My my forebears are Catholic. The people who died that the faith should both have come to England and stayed in England, they're, they're Catholic. I owe them a debt of honor and gratitude. And to become orthodox seemed to me to be a form of self-gratification that the Holy Spirit was not inviting me to take. And so uh, so I I, I, uh, I kind of gave up on that prayer. I thought, well, this is not being offered. And so when I was invited to become fully Catholic by my local Catholic bishop and I prayed, and the, 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 it seemed to me that the Holy Spirit was saying, yeah, this is the moment. Do it now. Mm. That's right. So I did it. So no, yes, for for for, for personal preference, for for exoticism, for the Jesus prayer, for the music, uh, for some aspects of theology, for some of their saints, yes. Um, but in terms of being obedient to the Holy Spirit uh, and Jesus, no. And that's just it, right? I mean, sometimes the truth doesn't accord with our personal preference or feelings, and we have to submit ourselves to something higher. And that's difficult. That requires the death of the old man. Yeah. Always. I mean, and, and, and that never stops. And indeed, I thought it would get easier. I, I thought, I thought that if, as as I developed a, a Christian life, and obviously one fails and sins all the time, and then one throws oneself to one knees and says, "Lord, have mercy." Um, and I thought, I thought perhaps like going to the gym, one would develop muscles of sanctity. But what I found is, is that actually the the devil never the devil grows stronger in some respects the flesh mm. the flesh remains perpetually flawed the devil never lets up and uh, the 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 last the last lap in this marathon is as hard maybe harder easier in some respects harder in others than the first lap so mm. uh, it, i mean i mean may, maybe i'm just not a very good christian or i'm you know may, maybe i maybe i'm uh, uh, well, for sure, for sure, I'm some way down. I'm a long way down the sanctity lists. Uh, but, but whatever the reason is, um, you can never give up. I understand so well when St. Paul says, "I run the race." Mm -hmm. You know, my goodness me, because I, I have, you know, in one sense, I'm sure he was saying, "This is hard. You can't take. You cannot take it for granted. You can take nothing for granted. Repentance is the only is the only thing you can rely on to keep you." to keep you there yeah uh, so um yes i'm sorry i think i've wandered from the question which is a, which is a very a very a very bad thing to do in, in a... <laughs> oh no brother you're doing just fine you know i i often hear 
you know, from Anglicans mm -hmm. that the primacy of the Bishop of Rome or even his supremacy is something <laughs> alien to the patristic church. It's not found in the fathers. It's not found in the councils. You know, it might shock some people, but there's even statements in ecumenical councils as early as Ephesus of the Bishop of Rome's role in the church. And I just, I have something interesting here from the Council of Ephesus. Now this is from Philip, the papal legate of Pope St. Celestine at Ephesus 431. He says, it is doubtful to none, nay, it has been known to all ages that holy and blessed Peter, the prince and head of the apostles, the column of the faith, the foundation of the Catholic Church, received from our Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior and Redeemer of the human race, the keys of the kingdom, and that to him was given the power of binding and loosing sins, who until this day forever lives and judges in his successors. So he's called the foundation of the Catholic Church and the keeper of the keys, and you know this authority lives on in his, his successors. And this is all the way back in 431. There's other examples. You can find the same uh, sort of teaching at Chalcedon, at Second Nicaea. So it, it's replete in the fathers and even the councils. You know, the to, yeah, of course, of course it is. But let's but let's add to that. I mean, that's wonderful. Con thank you. Congratulations. That's very good. But let's also add history to it. Let us let us understand. Let's look to see how the Holy Spirit works in history. So we have the Pentarchy. Mm. We have the apostolic foundations of Jerusalem, Antioch, Alexandria, uh, Constantinople, and Rome. So here we have five patriarchs, the five popes, if you like, right? Uh, 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 speaking Christian language. Um, and it's perfectly clear from scripture and some early councils that, that Rome has precedence. Now let's look what happens in history. So, so our Lord says to Peter, the gates of hell will not prevail against you. Let's look. So what happened to Jerusalem? What's happened to Antioch? What's happened to mm -hmm. Alexandria? What's happened to Constantinople? Oh, my word, there is Rome. <laughs> Shouldn't we say that, that this is the working out of our Lord's promise in history? The gates of hell have not prevailed against the patriarch of Rome. Now, one of the first things I did when I became a Catholic was to get myself a book on, on all the popes and to discover how corrupt and stupid some of them have been. Right, right. But one has to make a distinction between the person who holds the office and yeah, the office. And the office, yeah. And, and, you know, that is no less true today than it was ever true before. But we have to say, we have to be faithful to the idea of the Petrine office. And I just don't think it reflects very well on why would you want to diminish Peter's successors? What, what's in it for you? Is it, is it because the patriarch of Constantinople is saying some things that you need to hear and if they are more authentically of the Holy Spirit? Is it, is it because, you know, the, the others of the Pentarchate have, have got together and are challenging uh, the patriarch of Rome and we have to choose between them? It's nothing of the kind. That's not happening. So why, why is it happening? Only because people want to avoid the obligation of obedience and humility and accountability. Well, I wanted to avoid it. I know that. But let's not pretend. Let's, let's call it sin and pride and selfishness and not try and justify it theologically by, mis, by misreading history or the councils or, or, or the gospels. Yeah, and it's funny because if you look at the Oxford Dictionary of the Popes, uh, written by an Anglican, J. N. D. Kelly, yeah. uh, he talks about uh, Leo the Great and Gregory the Great, and he flat out says that they believed that they had care over all the churches. Yes, they did. Quite the admission. Yeah, yeah. Well, of course, the, the trouble is Anglicans play it both ways. When they when they when they want to uh, when they want to gain uh, po continuity points. <laughs> right. Then they tell the Catholic story, and when they want freedom not to be obedient, then they forget it. And you know, and that's the mm. problem. If if there was a consistent Anglican narrative, if if there was a consistent lament that, you know, we've split away from the apostol our apostolic mother, and she won't let us back, and we want to come back, and please may we come back, and what would it take to be reconciled? You know, then you mm. could take this seriously. But they don't say that. They've never said that. They, they, they want to come back only on their own terms, and they know perfectly well that's not possible. So, you know, the, the, the deceit of Anglicanism has always been, we're going to have ecumenical talks with Rome, but what are we going to give up? Nothing at all. Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. It, it, you know, it was a sterile dance. And, and then you know, the moment of, if you like, one of the most critical moments when uh, we had a very Catholic and apparently holy archbishop uh, occupying the same physical place that St. Augustine sat. Uh, and then the, the general in, embarking on, on, the, on the synodal way, 
<laughs> the Church of England then says, you know, we want we want to pay due service to feminism more than we want to pay it to Peter. How 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 Christian is that? How Catholic is that? So we're going to ordain women because we want to have feminist credentials, and we don't care about apostolic credentials. We mm -hmm. there's nothing. Well, how can you do ecumenism after that? You can't. Well, you can't. It's nonsense. What are some of the differences? I've, I've heard, you know, some Anglicans, for obvious reasons, don't want to align themselves with Protestantism. So they, they make a distinction between the Reformation in Germany and the rest of Europe and the English Reformation. What are some of the key distinctives between the two Reformations? Like, what makes the English Reform Reformation unique, if anything? Well, so what we have is we have a we have a spectrum of reform theology, and uh, and it involves. Um, there's a very good book called Reformations by um, uh, his name begins with E, and I can't pronounce it, uh, and so I won't try and pronounce it. But it it's published in the last four or five years, mm -hmm. uh, and I reread it in order in order to, to to rethink my Reformation history as I became a Catholic. I <clears throat> I began to reread this really magisterial book on it. Um, so that we have a spectrum of reformed positions from Luther through to Zwingli and Calvin, and they, you know, there are a number of areas of church life. There's 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 ministry, there's priesthood, there's the sacraments, there's there's justification, predestination, a whole a whole series of reformed preoccupations, mm -hmm. and basically they exist on the spectrum. And so, uh, I mean, part of the deceit of the Reformation exercise was that here were a group of Christians who were saying we justify our departure from the Catholic Church because we have the Holy Bible and we know God's mind better than the church does and so we are going to recreate a purer church because we know God's mind and then they they just never stop falling out with themselves so there are a, what are there a thousand ten thousand it depends how you define a denomination but yeah. surely at some point a Protestant should have said wait a moment We've made fools of ourselves. <laughs> this can't have been true. This that wasn't what we did. Um, but going back to your question, then as you as you go across this spectrum, what Anglicanism did was to forge a coalition that was about as broad as it could be. Mm -hmm. So, because the Church of England needed, for the sake of carrying the population with them, to have some element of continuity, uh, it, it it allowed some, you know, because it it, in, it it inherited the buildings for a start, and then right. you know, there, were, there were constant changes in canon law about what you could and couldn't have in the building, what what vestments, uh, what 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 icons, what relics, what liturgy, and these all changed in a terrifying way in the hundred years from Edward VI onwards through Mary and back to Elizabeth. Um, so Anglicanism set out to provide a compromise and if you like a uh, like a, pol a political the political party would be the best analogy because it was a political experiment as well mm -hmm. as a theological one so it drew together several political and theological parties in a loose coalition and said if we allow each other to continue to exist within the tent you know then then we are we are all best advantaged and so although this was com this was hugely incoherent i'll give an example in a moment uh, it was a political coalition of, a, of theological advantage. But but at some point it was nonsense. So even so Cranmer, in order to deal with the impossible question of, you know, either the mass is a mass or it isn't, mm -hmm. he provides in his prayer book two different words of distribution. So the priest says to the first person he brings the sacrament to, receive the body of Christ, given for thee, preserve thy body and soul unto everlasting life. Well, that's pretty Catholic. Yeah. But to the next person, he says, eat and drink this in remembrance that Jesus died for you and be grateful. Well, that's really pretty Zwinglian. So you have a priest going, I'm Catholic, I'm Zwinglian, I'm Catholic, I'm Zwinglian. And then there came a moment for me when, when I encountered this as a form of domestic abuse. So I was, I was, um, uh, I was standing with a friend of mine, a lovely elderly Anglican priest uh, in my transition period. And I was, he was inviting me to 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 to. Uh, the distribution of the sacraments. And as we went down the line, I heard not complementarity, which was I'd always been taught. Oh, look, look how broad, Cran look how inclusive Cranmer is. Look how multi-layered Cranmer is. I heard, I love you. No, I don't. I love you. No, I don't. It's the pattern of, of, of 
of domestic abuse. Here is Jesus. Nah, he's not. You've got to think. You've got to recreate it for yourself. Mm, you, know. Mm. you know, here is Jesus. No, he's not. And I thought, how did I do this? How did I? How did I spend years doing the sacramental equivalent of domestic abuse um, with this dreadful inconsistency? And this is right in Cramner's rubrics. Yeah, absolutely. And it's what the Church of England has always has always done. Um, and it, I mean, how can you? Well, the moment the moment you see it, it's 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 horrible. It's 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 abuse. Um, it's theological and psychological and sociological and ecclesiological abuse. Uh, either you know, for goodness sake, if the Holy Spirit has done something utterly wonderful in the Mass, let it be so. And Luther, of course, was just desperately convicted. Um, uh, not convicted. Luther was conflicted in this. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things I began to feel very strongly, I was, I was Enk, E Y N K C K, I think, the Reformation book. I began to see that the, the, the Luther, Luther had some profound psychological issues, which he sought out, he set out to to deal with theologically and politically, uh, and 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 guilt lay at the heart of it. But that didn't mean that he had a, a consistent theological system. He remained very close. To the Catholic position over the sacraments, and you know the story of, you know, right. when he and, he and Zwingli sat down at a German tavern to eat, and Zwingli did the good old enlightenment. Uh, you know, this is it's it's just bread and wine. It's, uh, get with get with the accidents, brother. That's all yeah. it is. <laughs> uh, and 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 Luther, unable to go, unable to be reformed, carved in fury on the table. Hoc est meum corporal. Mm. You cannot do both. Right, uh, right, and, and Anglicanism sought to it sought to do both, and and in doing so, of course, broke off from well, from all the Eucharist. I mean, what what did Anglicanism think it was doing about the Eucharistic miracles? Again, one of the first things I did as I started to think about becoming a Catholic was I went back and looked at the Eucharistic miracles, particularly as as they had been started. Not started happening again, but particularly as the outbreak of recent Eucharistic miracles at uh, Buenos Aires in '94 and and mm. Tixla in Mexico, uh, and, you know, and they've been taken to a laboratory and 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 the, you know, the Eucharist is human tissue. <laughs> this is yeah, yeah. this is utterly miraculous and amazing. What did the Anglic the Anglican Church knew about the Eucharistic miracles from uh, from Lanciano onwards? Uh, did did it think they were all? Hagiographical deceptions. What, mm -hmm. on what? And if so, on what basis? The Church of England, you know, Anglicans never had any authority. They only had the authority of the state, and uh, and they traded the authority of the state for a life of quasi ecclesiastical independence. And that's you know that's not that's not sustainable. Mm. So, Gavin, uh, you've been a bishop. Um, any plans, any discernment for the clerical state in the Catholic Church? Well, <laughs> so I'm right at the I'm right at the point of uh, uh, my Catholic bishop invited me to convert with the intention of ordaining me. Um, I won't bother people with how with with a description of the terrain over the last three years but but it's been it's been interestingly bumpy um the, the fact is the lord has given me a ministry in public uh on the internet and uh and and writing and uh it's a very full ministry indeed and one of the things i have to ask myself is and, and of course i can't see the future but but right. but yeah. let, but let's so essentially does the church need me more uh, offering a priestly ministry or needly more and, and I, I i hardly dare pronounce the word it's so presumptuous but would need or need me more prophetically do i do, does the church need need gavin to speak and write without the capacity of being called to heal or or does he need me to add to the numbers of those who offer the sacrifice and the mystery of the mass it's a very it's a very close thing and i'm mm -hmm. i'm uh, i'm i'm not at all clear at the moment uh, which of those he's asking me to do. Well, let me uh, and the others who are watching, please join in prayer for Brother Gavin's discernment. Uh, because I could tell, you know, whatever way the Holy Spirit uses you, it's going to be in a magnanimous way. And for the work that you're currently doing, the work that you've done, I'm very thankful 
So, <clears throat> Gavin, uh, as parting words, let's say that an Anglican is watching. An Anglican says to you, I'm already Catholic. I don't need communion with Rome. Why should this person become Catholic? Well, first of all, you need communion with Jesus. <laughs> the only way you'll get communion with Jesus is at the Mass, because otherwise uh, you're just going to get some rather bad-tasting wafers and 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 some uh, some um, and some some wine. And you know, the, the, nothing wrong with wafers and wine. And there's no there's no problem in thinking holy thoughts about the sacrifice of Jesus. But if you have any understanding of the Eucharistic miracles, as they validated what Aquinas and and other son, and our Lord Himself said, "Then for, you know, I mean, I, I began to do some work on the Lord's Prayer, and and uh, I, I came across, you know, uh, this is another story, but there's a chiastic structure to it, and the center of the chiastic structure, so so line one and 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 line seven define each other, two and six, uh, uh, three and five, and in the middle is is the central line. Give us this day our daily bread, mm. and uh, uh, and it was." Um, uh, uh who, who who mistranslated it it'll come back to me in a moment i'm getting old and but but it's it's epiusios arton it, it's it's a it's a magnificent word it's not found anywhere else epi and usios i mean any theologian ought to get very excited when the word usios comes into play right. and epi of course is everywhere so so the, the the word that the apostles chose to use in greek to represent what our lord was saying is it's been translated by the clumsy super substantial the the everywhere being bread is what you know epi usios mm -hmm. The, the, the bread of existence that, that, that permeates everywhere. It's the most amazing phrase. It's clearly not grace for lunch. I mean, although we right. want Jesus to feed us um, and we want three square meals on our table every day and we better pray and give thanks, that's not our daily bread. Right. Our daily bread is Jesus. And it's, it's the art on epusion. It's the miraculous, super substantial word, bread of life, bread from heaven uh, that he taught about at the feeding of the 5,000 and when he described himself as a bread. It's Jesus in the mass. Mm -hmm. If you're an Anglican, you're not getting your daily bread. <laughs> you can only get it. Uh, you can't get it in the Protestant church. You have to either be Catholic or Orthodox. And, you know, and, and if you claim to be Catholic, you want Jesus in the mass. Well, you have to become Catholic. You can't, mm -hmm. you know, Anglican orders are invalid. Who you, you say you say you believe you say you're a Catholic, and so then you 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 pray for the Pope, and when the Pope says your mass is invalid and your orders is invalid, what do you do? You say, stuff the Pope. That's not Catholic. <laughs> you right. have to choose between being Catholic, in which case the orders are invalid. And why are they invalid? They're invalid because there are historical problems about continuity, about tactile continuity. A bit like the Celtic Church. We can't prove it either way, but it's doubtful. But they're invalid because the church spent 150 years saying we are not ordaining people to the priestly ministry offering the sacrifice of the mass. Mm. We are specifically not doing that. And when Leo XIII looked at Anglican ordination, he said, even, even if now you want to regraft Catholic theology and ecclesiology, ecclesiology onto the, it's too late. You've been ordaining people into this non-priestly, non-mass you don't have a, an, a priesthood to inherit. So, so I'm really sorry, guys, but the priesthood is defective. It's, it's a construct of your political and theological imagination. So if you're a Catholic, Anglican, and you want Jesus, you have to become Roman Catholic. And if you're a Catholic Anglican and you believe in the patristic church, you will not find it in, in, in the Church of England because the Church of England in its article says, when we want to believe patristic and the, the, from, the, from the ecumenical councils and from the fathers, we will. And when we don't, we won't. That's not the Catholic Church. Um, and then you must look and see what, what it's become. And what is this become is, is, is a feminized, uh, ethically compromised, uh, incoherent ecclesial body where, as, as a, a bishop friend of mine once said, as we left a synod where the church had decided emphatically not to give hospitality to Orthodox Anglicans Eucharistically. He said, the Church of England is a 500-year-old ecumenical experiment, and tonight the experiment failed. And I'm afraid that's true. It, it was an interesting ecumenical experiment, mm -hmm. and it's failed. So if you want Jesus in the Mass and you want to be a Catholic, come home to Rome. <laughs> Well, there it is. You can't get more clear than that. Uh, Our Lady of Walsingham, pray for us and pray for all our separated brothers and sisters and bring them home into the arms of Christ in union with Holy Peter. 
Uh, well, Gavin, uh, this time has gone by very quickly, and I so immensely enjoyed our discussion. I want to thank you for your graciousness and your time. It's very valuable to me, and it made my day. I've been wanting to speak with you for a long time, and I can't thank you enough. Uh, if people want to find more about you and the work that you're doing, where can they go online? So I have a web. I have a website. It's, it's ashenden.org, um, and uh, I put all my stuff there. I, I write for the Catholic Herald now. Uh, and I write for the Catholic, uh, I do the Catholic Herald podcast. Please subscribe to the Catholic Herald. It's the it's the it's the conservative, traditional, faithful Catholic uh, journal, and it's and it's it needs new readers if it's going to survive. So if wherever you are, if you want to help Catholicism in England, um, and you don't and you don't want it to have uh, a progressive journal, the, you know, the the alternative, the competitors are the tablet. It's it's a it's it's mm. a very it's a very progressive um, journal, the tablet. <laughs> and so, mm. can I first of all, on behalf of my colleagues, invite you to subscribe to the Catholic Herald? Uh, there you'll find my work. There you'll find it also on my own web page, and uh, and I have a YouTube channel where I offer uh, not homilies but but catechesis and um, uh, my my web page is, is the key to it. And um, please pray for me, pray for the church. Uh, and pray for Francis, <laughs> uh, and, um, and and thank you. Thank you very much, and God bless you all. You're welcome. And uh, for your viewers who might not be familiar with me, Gavin, um, my podcast is, well, the way it started was I wanted to show the links and the continuity between the temple in Jerusalem and the Catholic Church as the restoration and fulfillment of Solomon's temple. Wonderful. So everything from the liturgy to Marian devotion, to vestments, to uh, temple furniture and architecture. I cover all that. Um, I also do apologetics, Catholic spirituality, and current church issues. So if And I enjoy a cigar while doing it, my other passion. So if you're at all interested, please subscribe to my channel. Uh, once I get to 1,000 subscribers, which I'm about 40 out right now, but once I do that, I'll be giving away uh, a book, uh, Matt Frad, How to Be Happy, According to the Thought of the Angelic Doctor. So if you'd like a free copy, uh, please help me get to 1,000 subscribers. I would really appreciate that. And guys, you've been watching Holy Smokes, Cigars, Catholicism, and Conversation. Let my prayer arise and thy sight as incense. I'm your host, Dustin Quick. This was episode 72, From Her Majesty to the Magisterium, with my new friend, Gavin Ashenden, from across the pond. It's been a great pleasure, my brother. Thank you, and God bless you, and God bless you all. Thank you for watching, and I'm sorry about the bots that invaded the chat. Uh, this is a new one for me, so I'll have to be on the lookout for that. St. Michael, pray for us. Okay, Amen. so I'm going to end the broadcast in three, two, one.